Welcome to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. With me this week is Nick Zimmer, CEO and biosecurity specialist with Plants Man. How are you doing today, Nick? Doing great. How are you? I'm doing excellent coming off that uh, holiday break. I'm feeling refreshed. How about yourself? I'm feeling ready to take on the new year, man. It was good. Perfect. Well, before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com. Nick, I always like to start learning a little bit more about how you got into the cannabis industry. So where was it that you got your start? Um, my first start was in college and I, uh, kind of dove into hydroponics was my first little endeavor and, uh, bought a little deep water kit and grew a few plants in my, you know, apartment in college and, um, fell in love with it. It actually kind of changed my direction and the, you know, trajectory of where I was heading. Um, and I fell in love with the plant and really just love plants in general. So it's, uh, it's been a fun process the whole time. What is pesticide-free cannabis production? So our goal is to eliminate all pesticides from any grow facility. Um, Really, we're taking the place of these pesticides with beneficial insects. So we're kind of swapping out uh, a chemistry for um, some biology that is already working in nature. We're kind of just harnessing it and utilizing it in a specific manner inside these facilities. So... Using good bugs, I feel like that seems like common sense that goes back to the beginning of time. When did we sort of get away from that in the industry? Well, I mean, current agriculture has led us down a path of, uh, you know, monoculture and, you know, grow everything the same, spray it all with something really hard, kill everything off um, versus this kind of like ecosystem thought process where we're building up the ecology and we're, we're utilizing nature to kind of help us balance things out um so it's kind of been back and forth in ag and we're kind of going back towards it in the current state where organic is is trending and same in cannabis you really you can't even spray that many options so in current cannabis models you really don't have a, a bunch of tools in your tool belt for what you can spray and still pass a test um which is really what lends these bugs to cannabis specifically because they're really a great tool and there aren't a lot of good tools out there to use currently. So how do you use these bugs for organic pest prevention? So the key with using beneficials is all about prevention versus um, curing a problem. So if you can start by, think of it like we're inoculating our plants early in their cycle. So when they're young and veg, um, we give them a dose of a several different Um, species of bugs that are going to target several different pests. Um, So we'll dose them early in veg and then we'll dose them again two weeks, two to three weeks later and keep that same kind of interval going um, so that you can always stay ahead of your pest. The key is keeping the tipping point in favor of your beneficial and not letting that um, pest kind of get its reproductive rate ahead of your, your good guy. When you're talking about good guys and beneficials, what types of bugs are we talking about here? So the, we sell a lot of different types. There's probably four or five main species of bugs that I use. Most of them are what I would consider predatory mites. So they're going to be fairly microscopic. I mean, most of the time you, you could spot them, but you're really going to want a microscope to evaluate them or look at them up close. Um, These are going to be, you know, either living in the soil or living up on the plant and are going to target uh, several different pests. Um, But there's beetles we use. There's um, microscopic nematodes that we use, um, some flying, some crawling. There's a big gamut of different um, types of beneficial or good bugs that we use. Um, And they all kind of either target a specific pest or are a generalist and will eat a few different things. How, how did you get into this side of the business? Um, I mean, I'm, I went to school for horticulture and was trained as a conventional grower in ornamentals, um, where part of my job was putting on a, a Tyvek suit and a gas mask and spraying down my entire 
60,000 square feet of growing space with Avid or something nasty that was probably going to lead to my death eventually. Um, and I would had heard about this and proposed it at my previous employment. Um, and so uh, we started implementing it there. We started phasing out some pesticides, seeing some benefits. Um, you know, fast forward six, seven years, I now own my own, you know, commercial place where we grow ornamentals and I utilize these beneficials in my ornamental facility um, only. I'm a pesticide free facility, which is kind of our little niche here. Um, so it's, it's been, this is where I've kind of learned it all, you know, boots on the ground. Um, really that's where you learn all things, you know, school's cool, but um, using these bugs, watching them work, watching them not work um, has led me down this path to helping cannabis growers, which, you know, I, Feel like there's a big gap in the education and you know people like me willing to teach and show them the way what are some of the misconceptions with cannabis cultivators when it comes to beneficials um what i find a lot of growers are are using them as as a cure to a problem and I, i'm trying to reset this mindset of i want you guys to be using these bugs before there is a problem and it, it feels strange and unusual sometimes when you're just dumping these bugs and you don't have a pest even in the facility but that's the way they work best and that's the way they're most cost effective because you can use them at a pretty low rate whereas most growers right now are like nick i've got thrips or i got spider mites like what's my dosage what do i do and you know i have an answer but it's going to cost them a lot more and it's gonna um the frequency is going to be a lot heavier so what I'm, you know, again, I want people to be thinking in the preventative way, start early, stay on it. It's not a one and done. It's not a silver bullet. Um, it, don't expect to put them out and tomorrow your bugs are gone. Um, you're building an ecosystem and it's a different mindset. How long does it take to build that ecosystem? You know, like I was telling you, if you start early, it's pretty yeah. easy. Um, if you're coming in and your plants are already four or five feet tall and they're, you know, are they already into flower? You know, it, it's a different battle. So again, the inputs and the cost per plant can be very low um, if started early and vice versa. If you start late, it can be very expensive and not very effective. So um, yeah, I, does that answer your question? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Um, when you started on out on your own, what were some of the growing pains? Um, sorry for the pun. Everything's a pun in this industry. Um, <laughs> but when you got started, you know, first of all, could you believe that you were going to go completely organic, pesticide free um, with beneficials? And what were some of those growing pains as you kind of learned throughout your time? I mean, as I probably all cultivators will tell you, it's like you can never get used to any set circumstances. So you know, as soon as I feel like I've got a grip on thrips, you know, then my fungus not get out of control or something. So the fun part about growing plants is you'll never know it all. And for me, the growing pains have been, you know, understanding these life cycles of these good bugs and knowing when I have too much pest to really where my beneficials are going to have a hard time where I really should probably come in with a spray first um, to knock back the population. You know, it's, I'm, I still don't know half of, you know, what is out there. So it's, that's my favorite part of my job is learning every day. But the biggest hurdles I've come across are just managing pest populations, knowing where the threshold is on when these beneficials will actually take control versus when you really got to pull the plug and, and hit them with a spray. Um, and that just takes years of just being on the ground and throwing these bugs out there. What are those thresholds? You know, what is the, uh, the limit in terms of the bugs capabilities? You know, that's going to be different for each grower and facility and cannabis. We have a very low threshold in ornamentals. We have a totally different threshold. Um, and you know, in school that's called the economic threshold. And when is the damage so far that you have to make certain calls? Um, I, I can't give you like a concrete number per pest per plant. Um, mm. But obviously in cannabis, we have basically almost like a zero threshold where if you see a pest in the building, you're kind of freaking out already. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that having a few thrips is going to lead you to having a really bad harvest. Um, so it's, 
I don't, I don't want growers to have this zero idea or mentality because it's, it's a hard thing to meet. And if you've got an ecosystem built, you can manage it pretty well without having to do any sprays. Um, so I, I, it, I try not to, I try to keep things as, as vague as I can because each situation is different and, um, yeah, each grower is going to have a different set of circumstances that they got to kind of work within. So when you work with each individual grower or cultivator, how much, you know, are you going out to their grow? How, how much, uh, hands-on experience do you have working with them trying to remedy their problem? It really, uh, we're, I'll start by saying we're, we're a very new company, you know, mm-hmm. we're launched what three or four months ago. So in that time, um, I'm definitely boots on the ground, getting to these facilities. Um, not everybody wants me to do that. And not always do I have to do that. Um, it really just depends on the person in the scenario. I'm very happy and willing to go to places, but half of the time we can, I can ask a set parameter of questions and get a really good feel of, of the flow in the facility and how, you know, how they're running things and, um, you know, take it from there. So it's a, it's a mixed bas- basket of how I'm dealing with it, but I'm working directly with each person and setting them up with a specific program. Um, the cannabis industry has seemed like, instead of like, unlike many others, it seemed really open to being pesti- pesticide free, organic, and not just because of regulations, but because that's how operators want to run their shop. Is that something that you've experienced and has there been sort of a spike of interest ever since you got into the industry as a result of that? Um, I, I definitely see a lot of willingness to, to try new things. And I'm really not trying to, I'm trying to sell them an idea that's better for them, better for their employees and hopefully cost them less money. So it's, it's really the people that I talk to, it's, it's not a hard sell. I'm not selling them something that's not working. I'm not selling them something they haven't heard about. What I'm selling them on is, is heavy support, which is lacking in the industry. Um, you can buy these bugs from a lot of different places, but what our kind of separator is, is the support that we're willing to give our customers. And that's where I think really people are going to benefit the most from us. You know, they can call me and ask me these simple questions on how to release or, you know, what to follow up with or anything, you know, and I try to start them with the, the action plan, the plan of attack, you know, here's what you do week two, here's what you do week four, um, and so far, that's been working great. And these guys are very happy and are loving just the support. What are the sizes of the grows that you're working with currently? All across the spectrum, um, from yeah. basement 12 plant to like, I think our, we just started working with one of the biggest cultivators in California. Um, so they've got, I think, 3,500 lights um, wow. across 10 facilities. So... Michigan is our starting point. Um, we're branching out as we go. I've got, you know, probably seven or eight class C facilities here, you know, multi thousand plant grows. Um, that's our, that's our kind of our main customer is a, you know, a multi thousand plant facility. Um, but we, we don't discriminate and I'm, I want to teach everybody, you know, I really enjoy the process and I enjoy working directly with the customers and, and that's my kind of forte. Um, but okay. yeah, our, our, our ideal customer is a larger commercial facility. When you talk about building an ecosystem, what does that entail when you're transforming, you know, your grow operation into this ecosystem? I mean, we're really not changing much other than eliminating a lot of the sprays that are going to reduce the efficacy of our bugs. Now, I can, you know, I, I don't want people to stop spraying 100% because I in cannabis... We're still dealing with diseases and um, we need to stay ahead of those. So I always recommend having at least, you know, a once every two to three week, you know, fungicide treatment, whatever your favorite treatment is, and, and just time it to be away from your application of beneficials. But um, again, we are releasing at set intervals to build up a beneficial population in these spaces, whether it's in the soil or up in the foliage, um, so that if and when a pest shows up, we've got these little security guards ready to, to eat them. And, um, so it's, you know, there's, we're just inhabiting the the spaces with these good guys before the the problem ever can show up. You're working with such a large scale, um, producers. 
A, how do you keep up with uh, bug production? And then what do you do with the bugs after the plants are ready for harvest? Okay. So our bugs are grown to order. So mm. they're not sitting in a warehouse, like waiting for these people to put in an order. Um, when you order from me, there's a seven day lag usually from when you order to when it ships to you. And that's because our bugs are being farmed. And once we get our orders, they are getting packaged and shipped based on those orders. So you're getting like the ultimate freshness, which also is kind of what's helping us separate from some of the other um, suppliers is they will have faster ship times, but they will be sending older bugs. Um, so managing our inventory is done by having a large insectary that can deal with the capacity. Um, you know, they're not just selling to cannabis. We're selling to huge agriculture based, you know, facilities that are growing strawberries or growing tomatoes or peppers. You know, these are bugs that are widely used across ornamentals and edibles currently in the United States and Europe and everywhere. Um, so my, what I'm doing is really hyper-focusing this to, to cannabis mm -hmm. and, and streamlining it and trying to make it more digestible for these guys. Um, yeah, no. So then, so then what happens to the bugs when the plants are ready for harvest? Yeah. So the way we release is we generally will stop releasing week two to week five of flower. And most to all of these bugs life cycle is a two to four week life cycle. So we're going to make this assumption that basically all of our predators are going to be dead and gone well before we harvest the plant. And um, they generally can't navigate a flowering plant very well as far as like up in the flowers themselves. So they're not going to generally get stuck in those trichomes because they really can't do much in there. Mm -hmm. So from all the growers we've worked with, we've never had a test result or visible bugs show up in a test where it was a problem or anything like that. So I, I have heard that many times and I like to reassure people that it is not something that you need to worry about and just make sure you you stop releasing mid flower and they'll be dead and gone by the time you go to harvest. What is the releasing process like? Totally dependent on the bug. Um, mm -hmm. Some bugs come at, in a sachet, um, which is just a fancy term for a pouch. I don't know why they call it a sachet. It's, just makes everybody crazy. So I'm going to, yeah, it's the pouch, the hanging pouch. Okay. And uh, you can hang it right up on the stem of the plant. Um, those I generally use in flower as a really nice, clean delivery system for a lot of the predatory mites we use. Um, I have a couple tubes I brought. This is a, I just got this today. We're going to be releasing it at a, another facility on Friday, but this is a little, it's a rove beetle um, and it's fairly big. You can see it with the naked eye. You would take this and you would sprinkle about a teaspoon on the soil surface of each plant that you have. And in okay. each teaspoon is going to be anywhere from 20 to 50 little uh, beetles. They're going to cruise around the soil looking for, you know, fungus gnats and thrip larvae. Um, and they'll, that's where they'll live. Same with this one. This is a, another soil dwelling predator mite. It's called stradiolalaps. Um, and this is another one that you will apply as a tablespoon right to the soil surface. Um, some of them are like, for instance, our nematodes, which are a commonly used product. Um, these are something you submerge in water and then drench your plants with. So you'll water your plants in with the solution of nematodes. So there's a very, very wide spectrum of, you know, application ways and uh, delivery methods, but. How, how do you make sure like, uh, so do with each uh, teaspoon or uh, release, how do you make sure they, do they stay on that same plant for their lifespan or do they move to other plants? That'll again, kind of like totally depend on the bug. There are some mm -hmm. bugs that at, in part of their life cycles, like, like this one right here, the uh, rove beetle in and it's a adult form. It will fly. Oh, okay. So um, you put them in, I try to dose each pot. And then um, they'll migrate around, whereas the, the predatory mites will not. And they will, um, they will pretty much stay on one plant. They're pretty small. They're not going to move a whole lot. If your canopy is touching each other where plants are, you know, you're touching well, they will migrate a little bit. But most of these bugs are living in, one, in their one plant area, roughly. Okay.
but yeah, but there are a few like lace wings and, and Aureus and Delosha, which will fly around looking for bugs. How do you determine which bug to use depending on the application? You know, it, it all goes back to like getting all the information from the grower, kind of putting it for me right now. It's, it's my brain that can kind of formulate these plans based on the parameters I'm given. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actively working on streamlining this process and, you know, making some charts for growers that you can just pop on and, and put in your own parameters and, and get a better grip of, you know, what to use. But right now it's, it, you know, I have maybe 10 questions that I ask each grower and based on those questions will lead me down a path to certain um, bugs. Most of the time it's the same bugs, just in certain quantities mm. and frequencies based on what they've told me, whether they've got, you know, pests in the building or um, depending on their sanitation protocol, um, their pot size, you know, some, those are some of the questions that I will be asking, but it's not, there's no one size fits all. That's for sure. So is the bug calculators, are the bug calculators on your website? Are, is that just your brain? No, I mean, there that, you know, that is uh, a documented dosage rate okay. based on square foot. Um, I don't think that that always fits the parameters I'm given. So, mm -hmm. You know, especially on the smaller grows, it's tricky because my num my quantities are really based for bigger facilities. So we got to get a little creative when it comes to smaller facilities. Um, but my job is to kind of work within the closest size range of a product to fit in with their facility size. And, you know, I'm again, I'm, I'm actively working to try to streamline it and make it a little simpler for everybody. Well, I think it's really interesting because every application is different for you and kind of poses a unique challenge. It does, which makes it fun. And uh, I like that part, but it also makes it a little challenging to, you know, and there isn't, there isn't, a, there isn't an answer key, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's based on real world experience and like what the, the information I'm given and, you know, we, work, we do the best we can, then we adjust. It's not like we set these plans and then walk away from them. We we ask for feedback, we follow up, and then we make adjustments based on how it's working and costs. And, you know, we want them to spend the least amount of money and get the best efficacy they can. Mm. Is some of that fluidity difficult for cultivators in terms of there's no set charts or anything? I definitely think, you know, growers would love a chart. And I'm, I, when I create a plan, I actually give them a chart. Okay. I give them what I would call, I mean, a lot of cultivators are used to like a nutrient chart where they'll just follow a plan based on their nutrients. And I am try I've created the same thing for cannabis, you know, every week's laid out and here's the products on the other side and use it on this, you know, this week. And they find that very helpful. Okay. And I'm, I'm trying to make it more generalized for the, you know, general audience. But again, I build one of those for each individual facility and it's something that they can follow and track and, you know, when it comes to quality control, you said that the, the bugs ship from, I believe, is Maryland and New Jersey. How often do you quality control uh, your suppliers just to make sure that they're still providing a premium product? A great question. Well, luckily, I'm a, not only a supply, like a distributor, but I'm also a user. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm using these same bugs in my facility on the regular. So I luckily get to check them out and I'm... I'm a nerd, so I like to get the microscope out and like see what they look like and play with them. So um, I am my own quality control currently, um, but we also, you know, we're in contact with all these growers weekly, you know, so it's, I'm asking them regularly how, you know, for feedback and, you know, it's, these are bugs. These are, you know, a perishable product. We do package things based on the um, temperature where we're shipping. So like, you know, things going to Montana right now are going to get different than things going to Michigan and um, or wherever. So things can happen. And we always tell people, you know, when you when you get your package, it's important to open things up and to take a look and uh, inspect your bugs. Make sure that you see activity because, you know, there are times where they do perish and you can totally get your credit back. And um, so it's it's definitely something they're they're a, they're a live animal. Those nematodes, when I was looking them up and on your website, I just can't get out. They just remind me of sea monkeys so much. Yes. They're creepy, <laughs> but they're cool. They are. And they, I'm, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I mean, they, and like how they kill and, you know, 
it's just kind of gross and sweet and disgusting all at the same time. <laughs> are they only used for indoor grows or are beneficials also used outdoors? Yeah, they're, they're used outdoors. Um, you know, nematodes are used a lot for like rub control. And again, like this is um, products that have been out in the world for a long, long time, like since the eighties, you know, and I'm really one of the few first people that are really, again, focusing in on cannabis, but um, yeah, these have, these, these have been out forever. They're used for indoor and outdoor. Um, you know, obviously you can get a little more, I guess, efficacy in a closed facility where they aren't flying away, but the bugs that we're using are naturally occurring bugs that you're going to find in your ecosystem in the summertime. Um, and we're basically bringing them in at strategic moments when they might not be present naturally. Um, so, I mean, a lot of the bugs I'll find in the summertime and, um, you know, it's just interesting to see, to see them naturally working. Is there a steep learning curve? For example, you know, for people that are listening to this podcast, they want to get started right away. How long does it take to train them up and kind of get them ready to use beneficials in their facilities? Um, I would say that it is not hard. It sounds a lot harder than it is. And especially mm. when you have another human to just talk to, um, it, I can make it very simple. Um, mm. And it's usually, in most facilities, we're usually using maybe three up to five bugs total. Um, and we're using them in a, usually in a bi-weekly fashion. So every two weeks for shipping them something they're releasing strategically um i would say half of the time the grower will call me and just have some follow-up questions about you know am i releasing this the perfect way and you know so that's that's the kind of dialogue i like in and i don't people that have never used bios can order today get them next week and feel comfortable releasing them with my guidance beyond that okay it's not is it something that can ruin a crop if it's used wrong? No, that's the beauty. You can't overdose it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can only waste your money. That's really all the downside would be. Um, so no, there is no downside. And again, when, when done properly, you actually might even save money. Um, if you're actually eliminating a weekly spray uh, and, and you know, changing that to a bi-weekly or every three-week bug application. Um, so it's really just changing the mindset, but no, you can't overdo it. Um, I've tried, it doesn't, nothing bad can happen. Do you think the cannabis industry is dealing with issues with diseased plants and weakened genetics? Um, I mean, I think we're, we're always driving the market with, um, choices based on flavor and, you know, THC production and not necessarily like vigor or ability to resist diseases or bugs um which can lead us down a path of you know breeding these plants that are very inherently weak um so i think that's just the nature of this industry like there's no getting around that we're not going to focus on you know building these disease resistant plants and really focus on the the flavors and the in the production so i think we just got to focus on being smart on our SOPs on, you know, sanitation and bringing in new genetics and that kind of stuff to really keep the problems at bay. I mean, if you're smart and you follow a few set protocols, you can really keep a lot of your issues from ever arising. Um, so yeah, I think you, yes, you, you're right. We are inherently doing that whether we mean to or not. When you talk about introducing bugs into the like uh into the cycle unnaturally um does that mess up i guess just the nature of the plant in any way it's also a good question not that i've been able to come up with um plants enjoy i, I think plants thoroughly enjoy not being sprayed i yeah. truly believe that um whether they you know they just they, they seem much happier from my experience <laughs> um so yeah, I don't know. No, that's, I mean, uh, that's a good point. And one point that we really didn't talk about when it comes to pesticide use is worker safety. And that has to, you know, has to be, especially when it comes to a worker shortage in the industry, 
when you're coming to when you're choosing between working at a facility that's pesticide free and a facility that's not, I have to think that somebody working at the operation might go somewhere that's pesticide free. Absolutely. And I mean, I, again, I'm, I've been on the other side as a grower and it's just like, that was the least, that was the thing that sucked the most. And I'm, I'm sure most growers who have to spray, I mean, you, you got to do it either, you know, super early or at night. Um, you got to suit up, you know, just, there's not many fun parts other than just being in the facility with no other people. But um, yeah, you can release these bugs with your staff in the room. There's no re-entry interval or REI. There's no, you know, there's no downfalls. And for me in the ornamental industry, you know, I have a lot, I have access to a lot of good chemistries that can kill a lot of bugs. Mm -hmm. And those chemistries are a lot cheaper than using my beneficials. But I have found so much value to not spraying and whether it's actual, you know, money, money to money, it doesn't, I don't equate it. It's like my quality of life is skyrocketed from not having to spray one or two times a week with a terrible chemistry. And instead I can have my kids with me going to release in the greenhouse. Um, and you know, so it's just, it's, to me, it's got so much value beyond just financials. When you talk about quality of life, um, has it, was there anything health related at all? Not really, but you know, being in the industry, you, you see some old timers that, you know, they were stirring, stirring it with their finger and like, you know, they're probably going to melt away eventually because of their, you know, exposure to toxic stuff. So I don't know, you know, I just, if you can avoid putting a carcinogenic thing around you then do it, you know, it's an easy, it seemed like a no brainer to me, you know, no, <laughs> but no, I, I didn't have any specific health, you know, scares or anything. I just constantly being aware of it, you know? No, I, I understand what you're saying. And do you think it's a generational problem or not a, gen, a, a generational acceptance where the older generation is more accepting of pesticides? I just, you know, personally, I know that, uh, when we go to my cottage up North, uh, the older generation in the family will just spray everything with poison. And, you know, I'm just sitting there like, you know, we're going to, we're going to live here for the next two weeks. Maybe we don't, maybe we don't do that. And it's just, uh, that's how they've always done things, you know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's been my experience, um, from agriculture to ornamentals to cannabis. It's like, you know, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Just like they say, I mean, you, and it, you know, it works. You spray, they die. You know, it's like yeah. you can rely on it. It's, um, but you don't always see the immediate downfalls right in front of you, you know? And, and I don't think they, it, it was just a different time back then. And, you know, they don't care. Yeah. That's, it's one thing that it just blows my mind. I'm like, it says cancer on the bottle. <laughs> Brain, it was shorts on and sandals and like a nice windy day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, will there be, um, are there any issues with using beneficials with current state regulations and do you foresee any issues, um, in the event that it ever goes federally legal? No, uh, currently no issues. Um, the other beauty for people that are using, you know, metric, um, is they don't have to log this stuff. So like mm -hmm. you can use beneficials without having to like, you know, go write it down and put it in your system. And that's just another layer of labor that you don't have to worry about, um, which you do have to do with any sprays. I don't know. I, to me, this market's only growing. Um, and I don't see any issues based on the history of this product and how it's currently used nation, like worldwide. Um, there, there are no issues. Um, and they've kind of worked out any weird quirks, at least that have ever been. I haven't really come across where they had to like pull a bug off the list of availability and, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's awesome. There's nothing, nothing super bad about it at all. Good bugs. So you recently, you recently announced the new nematode capsules. Do you have, um, how has that product roll, rollout gone so far? And do you have any, um, new products in the pipeline? So the nematode capsules are super cool and were developed really actually for like houseplants, um, for people that have gnats in their houseplants. And, mm. um, they're just, the application method is so beautiful compared to the standard where you have to 
mix with water and then you got to um, run it through your pump system or, or hand, um, you know, water each plant. This can be worked into a transplant moment. So like when you're already touching your plants once, so you're not adding any labor, you're getting ready to transplant them into their final container and you just sprinkle a few of these beads around the top. Um, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And, you know, I think most cannabis growers are really fighting the fungus gnats um, the most. Fungus gnats and thrips are probably my top two. And this product will treat for both of those or at least treat for one um, stage of those bugs. Um, so it's, it's very exciting. And again, it, my goal with all these products is like I try to not add labor if I don't have to. And when you can already be touching your plant and then just add an extra teaspoon to a, an equation, it, it doesn't add much at all. Um, so that's my selling point to a lot of the growers is like, man, it's, you're barely adding any cost to the whole thing and you're getting three to four weeks of control on the fungus gnats. Um, so it's kind of a no brainer. So it's been really good. I just am trying to teach everybody about it and show them how cool it is. And most people are still like confused on what, what to do and how to work it. And um, just for your own, for everyone's future reference, I'm going to be building some release videos this week um, that will be accompanying all of our products. When you purchase them, you'll get a video to show you exactly how and what to do with it, um, which isn't really widely available right now. Okay. Well, I think anytime that you can help educate the industry, they generally seem very receptive to that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, what are the, uh, what are you planning next for plants, man? Um, I mean, so I didn't really answer your other part as far as new products. I don't have anything exciting coming down the pipeline that is announceable now. Um, mm -hmm. but we, I'm sure we will be coming up with some new stuff down the road. I mean, I'm working directly with a much larger corporation that, you know, is developing these with scientists right now. Um, so it's, I've got some good backing and I'll be sure to announce as soon as we have some new stuff. As far as new plans for the plantsmen, you know, we started aggressively in Michigan. We are working on um, spreading our wings to the other states. I mean, we sell across the country right now, but we are trying to make our presence known um, in some of the other states. So that's our current kind of push right now is just break into the market further. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for your time. It's been very educational. This is a part of the business that I really, you know, I've, uh, I've known about in other industries, but I've never really had a chance to talk about how it's used in the cannabis industry. Awesome. Well, I'm glad I got a chance to talk to you. It's been very fun and I hope everyone got a good dose of education on bugs and what to do and what not to do. And is there, you know, before we get out of here, is there anything that we might've left out or anything in particular you want to make sure that the cannabis equipment news audience knows about plants, man, or good bugs? Well, again, you know, I'm here to help. I want to be everyone's resource for figuring out this game. Um, it, it can feel confusing. It can feel daunting, but it, it really isn't. And if you have any questions, please reach out. We've got a great website, but you can always reach me um, at 248-916-8550. That's my direct line. You can shoot me a text. Um, but I hope you guys gained a lot from this, and uh, I, I'm excited for the future. Excellent. Well, Nick, thanks again for taking the time. I hope we get a chance to do it again soon. Thanks. I really appreciate you. You have a great rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Well, before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com. For Nick Zimmer, CEO and biosecurity specialist at Plantsman. I'm David Manti. This is the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast.